but it's great to see you again. Uh, you know, it's been really rather uh, trying times. And uh, what, one of the things that I'd like to share with you is I spoke recently with a friend of mine in the UK and they were saying how fortunate we are here in Switzerland to be able to go skiing. And, you know, you just came down from, the, from your place in the mountains. So I thought this was an appropriate anecdote to share with you. <laughs> and they said, you know, we're in lockdown mode in, in London, uh, you know, severely restricted. And, and here you are skiing in Switzerland. And my comment was, you know, you're right. It, it's, it's a bit like being allowed to dance on the Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> it felt a little bit like that, even for me, yes. I thought, yes, we're very fortunate to be dancing as we go down here. <laughs> Actually, for me, it was also a really special Christmas um, in the mountains because we go there almost every year now, always a small family, uh, you know, my wife, my two boys and me. And this time, my son, um, uh, it was the first time my son was working because, my, you know, he started a, an apprenticeship at Credit Suisse. And he had to go back down a week earlier than everybody else. <laughs> so here we are, the parents, you know, staying there on holidays, and my son goes to work. Well, that, that, that's the way it should be. I mean, Herman, don't you? Know, <laughs> I have children if they don't work for you. I mean, that's how it was in the Middle Ages. Why should it be different today? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Actually, I'm, I'm preparing now my son to take over the company so that I don't, I don't have to work anymore. <laughs> so this Christmas, we, it was the first time that we did a video interview together where he shared his ideas of the stocks that he wanted to buy. And we published it already. It's already out there on the internet. Well, so that, that's a good segue into, into talking a little bit about Obermann. And, you know, Herman, it's going to be your 20th uh, year anniversary for the company. Yeah, indeed. And, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it, that tells you that time does um, move forward. And, you know, maybe it would be just good to get a, um, a little bit your thoughts on why you started the company. What, what, what prompted you to, to, uh, to create Obermott? And, and what is the, you know, the capability that the company is offering? Well, I'm more proud about the capability that we offer today, 20 years later, than how we got started. Because, you know, we got started in 2001. You know, on August 24, we sat at the, at the restaurant at the Lake of Lucerne, and we decided we want to head out on our own. And the reason was pretty much desperation. Um, it was the beginning of a recession. Uh, the dot-com bubble had just burst, and uh, we were both working for dot-com companies. And we were looking at job offerings. There was nothing interesting on the market. And we sat there in that restaurant at the lake and we, we thought about what we could do. You know, what could we do? You know, we had internet experience. We, we, we were part of management teams of technology companies, but that wasn't really in demand anymore. So we wrote the business plan. And uh, when I did uh, my anniversary speech five years later, in, in the same restaurant, actually, you were present too. I wanted to, I wanted to go back and see what the strategy was and to see how well we executed on the strategy. And the crazy thing was, we wanted to do something completely different from what we actually did. The idea there at the restaurant where we found it Overmod was to consolidate internet service providers. Something we briefly followed for about 18 months, but uh, we definitely made a lot more money in consulting, and that's how Obermott got started first as, as a consultancy. So today, after, you know, it seems appropriate that 20 years ago it was desperation. And I think a lot of people today feel um, that that feeling is quite appropriate. So what would you, you know, how are you positioned today, 20 years later? What, what, what is it that you're offering as a company? Well, that consulting was in executive compensation uh, and performance measurement. And out of that came a method of measuring performance of companies. We had the idea in 2001, where it's, it was still early days of the internet, that there's so much more data now available, or at that point was available uh, on, on financial balance sheets and profit and loss statements of companies, that this data could actually help uh, managing a company. And we tried to identify methods or come up with solutions 
that help a company manage their operation. And it was pretty much benchmarking, really, data mining in the environment of a company that we were looking at and seeing how well they did in their market. And for a couple of years, we provided uh, a type of benchmarking uh, indexing, uh, we called it soon, that helped strategy departments see how well they did in the market. That was really the starting point. And that came 2009, and obviously in 2009, remember, it was the credit crisis, uh, a big uh, uh, recession, which is now called the big recession. Um, and that, that basically killed the budgets that we needed for selling our services. And we had to rethink. Out of that, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that seems like a very appropriate to today. <laughs> a lot of companies are killing their budgets because you know, they have, they have sales shortfalls. So, uh, you know, against that background, you know, what, what are you able to offer given the fact that companies are very much looking at, at uh, how they spend their money? Yeah, absolutely. In, in 2009, it was very similar to 2020, uh, except that in, at that time, it was, um, it was kind of a, the end of a big bubble where everybody speculated way too high now, you could, again, say this is the end of a big bubble, but it's not, um, it, it's not due to a bubble that we have the recession, it's due to uh, natural factors. Um, but it's really very much the same thing. What we did in 2009, we decided since strategy departments don't have the money anymore to pay for our benchmarking and strategic controlling services, we needed to find a place where they were desperately in need of, a, of, of this type of analysis. And we found that place in executive compensation. We re realized that with the credit crisis in 2009, uh, almost no budgets were uh, achievable at that point. That meant all variable pay for executives was basically wiped out. So we had companies that had their toughest year in history, uh, management teams that worked the hardest uh, uh, in, in that year, 2009, and their bonus systems would tell them, you don't get a bonus. And that's when we told them, look, we have to differentiate between those that are doing really bad because uh, you know, the recession hit them very hard and those that are managing the crisis actually quite well. And we came up with the idea that, you know, we should measure performance relative to peers to identify those companies that better manage uh, the recession than others. And here we are in 2020 and we have the same problem. Well, that's true. I mean, I think that is a fundamental issue about bonuses in general and to what extent variable pay makes sense. But I think most people would like to, most companies, you know, most boards want to incentivize management in, 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 that their interests are aligned with the company and, and that they're helping the company increase effectively the value to shareholders. So, you know, against that background, it's very hard to argue, let's just pay everything in fixed pay. Um, but when you have situations like this, where companies invariably try to still compensate their management in some form or fashion, it does sort of raise the question, well, what's the point of bonuses anyway? Because in a bad year, they'll still pay out some form of variable pay. So, so I could understand conceptually why this could be a meaningful tool because you're looking at relative performance to peers. And in doing so, even in a bad year where everybody's confronted with the same external factors, the ones who do better relative to those factors and to their peers to manage their business should be rewarded in some form or fashion. So is, is that effectively the type of measurements that you're offering companies, a way of looking at how they've done in a situation where they can't control all factors relative to other players who are in the same situation? Yes, pretty much so. This is pretty much our solution. Uh, you covered you know, a variety of things, you know, all the way to the question, should people be paid incentives? Um, uh, I, I, I try to tend to think, you know, that it makes sense to pay a manager for what you want from them. The more difficult thing is actually to identify what you want from a manager. Uh, it's really difficult because, you know, a lot of people would say like, that's very clear, you know, a manager needs to create shareholder value. Uh, 
and if if you don't believe in the financial markets uh, as much, you know, some are critical about that, then you say at least they should generate profits. But the problem is the true profits that a manager creates is in the future. You know, you, you manage your company and what you're doing really is preparing the company for a good future. And this future is not observable today. So while we can agree on the basic principle that you should create shareholder value and, and profits, it's only true in the long term. In the short, in the short term, it's very ambiguous. You know, take profits. You know, if you decide to invest in the future, you have lower profits because you're investing. You know, especially in a company where uh, these investments are research and development, which are not machines. So research and development is really just a cost component, lowering your profit. So basically, you have the the, the, the strange incentive, or, or actually, yeah, the, the, the misincentive, I would even say, that you're paying, you know, when you pay based on profit, that you're paying for doing less. You know, you basically pay managers that decide to not invest in your products, not invest in marketing, because they're going to have higher profits. So this is, this is a big problem in incentive compensation that I've been come aware over time. But it's not clear to me that mentioning, measuring against peers is, is going to be the solution if all your peers are only investing for short-term gains and therefore have better short-term profitability compared to those peers, your numbers are going to look worse and you will be, you know, you will be penalized accordingly because you won't be in the top half of your peer group. Yes, I, I fully, I fully agree with that. Uh, this is, this is a major conundrum uh, that I've been working on for a number of years. And I, I came up with a few solution uh, the last one being more recent. The first solution was really to not just look at profits, to also look at revenues, measure your revenues relative to peers. Now you could argue that the revenues are also in the future, but uh, people are not that rational actually. Uh, when you start paying managers for increasing their revenues, they just pay a lot more attention to what will uh, eventually increase their revenues. So having a revenue component as part of your incentive system really helps. Now, when you have that, it's really difficult <laughs> because of the high volatility in the markets. You know, it's really difficult to set revenue growth targets. You know, you may think that, you know, 5% or 8% is a good revenue growth target, but depending on what the market does, this could be excessively high, you know, right now, this year it would, would have been excessively high. And then in other years, uh, it may be way too low because the market is moving everybody. You know, that the tide lift, lifts everybody's business. And it would be stupid to say like, because everybody's doing good, we are paying an above average bonus. But when you measure relative to peers, when you measure your, your revenue growth relative to peers, it stays um, challenging even in an upturn. And what is also very good in a downturn, it stays motivating. So even if you have a contraction, like it happened now to many companies, at that contraction is smaller than the market, you still have a management team that is motivated for performance because you can still outperform your competition. Right, I, I understand that. But it, as you pointed out, if you're investing in the future with products that aren't even on the market today, you're, you're gonna have the cost, but you won't have the revenue or the profitability from that. And so if your peers are, doing acquisitions, um, and if your peers are not investing internally in R&D, their numbers will currently look better than your numbers. Maybe not in the future if you've come up with some incredible product that you didn't pay a lot of goodwill for, um, but in the, in the transition period, you know, you're gonna look worse and probably over a number of years. So you still, even with this measurement tool, I would argue, still have the risk that people will not invest in long-term um, uh, in innovation. Yes, I, I fully agree, and you have to solve that, that issue. Well, regarding acquisitions, this is actually something we account for. When we see peers uh, acquiring other companies, we take that effect out of their performance. So you cannot just buy a company and then do better. Uh, it, it really is uh, organic like-for-like -like growth that we are measuring. This is, this is the core part of our service, making sure uh, the peer data is comparable to your own operation. So, but, uh, so if you do a great acquisition, I mean, does that mean 
that acquisition for the next 20 years will not be included in your numbers? No, it will only uh, not be included in that first year that is not comparable to the previous okay, year. Okay, all right. After that, it's included. Okay, course. got it. Because, I mean, you know, a lot of acquisitions go south anyway, but, but if, you, <laughs> if you had the ability to actually make a, 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 an acquisition that is a great success, I guess you should be also rewarded for that. In fact, I, I would argue most companies... Um, because they're measured on their profitability and because they don't want to take a hit to their profitability, would rather acquire a company which has revenue and has profit as opposed to one which is on the cusp of achieving that because, again, they'll have earnings dilution by acquiring such a company. So it's, it's, in a way, it's fascinating how the metrics determine behavior. Um, I, and I guess one just has to say it is what it is, but your tool is trying to make sure you're compared to other players who are playing according to the same rules. And, and by making it relative, um, you're basically limiting the impact of factors that are beyond the control of, of the management team. Exactly, this, this, is, one, this is one aspect. And I, I showed you the, the smaller corrections that we make to um, account for the fact that most of the performance of a CEO is in the future. Now, recently, there was a development towards uh, ESG, it's called, you know, ESG stands for Environment, Social and Governance Criteria. And it has become really fashionable for companies to perform on, on their ESG ratings, you know, to do better there. And in the recent year, these ratings have become so relevant that they actually are now included in some of the compensation systems. And I looked at that over the past year. And the interesting thing is that many of those ESG factors that are used in executive compensation are actually forward-looking economic indicators. For instance, you know, a lot of companies um, look at their employees. They want to report how well they're doing towards their employees. And they're looking at things like turnover, uh, like injury rate, uh, you know, basically accident rates, and also internal training, and also employee satisfaction. So when you look at these indicators, these are now actually indicators for the future. A company that you know, treats their employees well and makes sure they develop and uh, they prosper will, will more likely have a good future than a company that exploits their employees. So what we're doing now, and this is really new, this is about a year old, maybe 18 months, it's, you know, I started to work on that in, in summer 2019. Uh, uh, um, now actually companies are beginning to realize that they should do more than just look at profits when they compensate their executives. So you have, how, how do you factor this into your, your index, your performance measurement system? Yeah, and this is actually really beautiful. Um, I, I first wanted to know what, what customers actually do. And I already mentioned the employees that do something similar, similar for customers. They look at customer satisfaction, at customer retention rate, at uh, net promotion, you know, promoting uh, uh, the company for other customers. So again, they're, you know, when they look at customers, they're, they're looking at factors that... Um, indicate if the customers are happy with what the company does. Then they go on to the environment uh, and they go on to governance criteria. And when I looked at this, when I looked at this information, I realized that it's still very punctual. It's still very, you know, just one thing, you know, company picks one, one metric and, and uses that in executive compensation. And none of them is transparent about how they measure performance. And I realized that our approach to relative performance measurement actually helps making these ESG factors a lot more transparent. So when you look at employee satisfaction and you show how that develops relative to your history or relative to peers, or you do the same for your customer indicators, your net promotion score, how does that look relative to your history? How does that look relative to your peers in your market? you suddenly have an indicator that, um, that is, uh, is a lot more relevant because you, know, you measure relative, it's a lot more relevant uh, for your future success. 
So you can you can actually so you have sales, you have profitability, but you also have some of these ESG indicators that you can that are comparable across companies that you can then use to see how you know the relative positioning is that is that possible? Exactly. You know, the more uh, relevant they are for the economic uh, success of the company, the more that they are captured by the professional data service providers. And of course, we are subscribed to the leading service providers, uh, which is Refinitiv, MSCI, Standard Poor's. These are, these are companies we subscribe to and we get that data and we can now measure a company's performance also on these ESG factors. While most of them are not really do good factors, they are really indicators for economic future performance. And this is where I see the future of Overmark, that we, that we add this to profits and revenues and shareholder returns and make executive compensation more forward-looking. So, you know, I think that's a, uh, you know important point because I'm looking at this and say, okay, look, you know, if, you, if a company has a really good CFO and, and, and a good controlling team in place, why can't they just themselves benchmark? Why can't they look at how, you know, the, you know a good, good management team will know who, are their peers, they'll, they'll want to see how their performance is relative to their peers in sales and profitability. So they can, you know, an internal group could handle this, I would argue. So why would they need Obermont? But um, maybe with the ESG criteria, which is sort of evolving, it makes sense to have a firm which is specialized in this area to provide a, a, a comparison base which is which is um, relevant. Uh, I don't know what your thoughts are, but but you know why why would I not be doing this internally? Why would I be turning to Obermann? Yes, uh, first of all, yes, uh, you have to look at your peers uh, as part of your strategy process, but you look at them very differently from the way we look at the peers. You know, if you or a company management, what you have to do is you have to look at how can you outperform your competition? What product features you know, can you identify that are important for you to make your company successful? It's much more of a product marketing oriented approach to benchmarking. Well, what I wanna do is I'm not so interested in what makes a company successful. I wanna see what is the trend in the market? You know, it's, it's more like, a consumer price index, which is actually quite boring. And I realized that many companies, because they're so much focused on what they should do, namely understand their products and their markets, that most of them don't really worry about indexing uh, their market so that they can use it in performance measurement. So even the companies that are large, uh, we, you know, we have very large customers, don't have strategy departments that are really focused on the nitty gritties of data mining to, you know, to have a comparable set of data. And so you think that that would be because you know I, I you know companies that I'm familiar with they'll, they'll know very much if they're gaining or losing market share in in the markets that are relevant to them, and you know so so they will you know they will have this insight. They may get Nielsen's data or whatnot and and say well you know that shows us if we're winning or losing the war, and we could use that data to decide if the management team is performing adequately or not. Yeah, but this data is a little bit dangerous. Um, if you measure market share. You know, suddenly the management team has an interest to define the market as small as possible. And what I'm doing is something completely different. I'm looking at management teams, individual teams, you know, that are in your environment, in your company environment, and I'm looking at their growth rates. So you can't make your market look smaller and smaller so that you look better and better. You still have to outperform those maybe 20 management teams. Uh, and uh, that also means Enlarging your market is interesting because the larger you define your market, the more growth potential you have. So when you come to when it comes to executive compensation, the Nielsen data is actually giving the wrong incentive, while our our peer approach outperforming the peers provides the right incentive. But isn't that very difficult to get companies to to change the traditional way that they look at? management compensation, uh, incentive compensation, because it's usually against the budget, you know? You do a budget, you agree on it, maybe the budget is set at the end of the year, maybe you have a rolling budget, maybe you do the budget at the beginning of the year when you've got last year's data, but usually that's your benchmark, and then you decide, have you done better or worse than that? And that defines incentive compensation. 
how, how are you going to get a company to, to move away from something that they feel they have some control over, i.e. the budget, uh, even if it's a rolling one, versus, you know, now all of a sudden it's going to be something devised by Obermott, which is looks a little bit like black magic because there's this uh, peer group that's being established and you're comparing us to that peer group. How, how, how do you make um, a board or even a management team feel comfortable that they aren't relinquishing control of their destiny? Well, what we found, it's actually funny enough, it's always behind the scenes, Douglas. That's unbelievable. What we found is that a lot of managers suffer from overconfidence bias. So even though they think they're negotiating really hard, most of these management teams have actually above market targets. So they're, they're measuring themselves against the budget that they think is low, but it's actually more than everybody else does. And the result is when they measure themselves relative to peers, they get a higher compensation than when they measure themselves relative to their own targets. The companies that first realize that are the, the true outperformance, you know, performers. We had a couple of companies that realized, you know, their targets are definitely above the market. They're, they're definitely, you know, they're aspiring to be top quartile performers. And, you know, they agreed with their boards to, for, a, for top quartile targets. But then that also meant that they only get an average bonus if they perform in the top quartile. And they realized early on that they need some a relative measurement approach. And so they came to us and said like, look, this is just unfair. You know, I'm setting myself so high targets you know, that I want to achieve, but it also means I'm always getting either just average bonuses or even below because these targets are really hard to reach. And they came then to us and asked us to measure their performance relative to peers. These were the early adopters. But even when I look at the, the broader uh, community of uh, companies that are at the stock exchange, most of them have long-term and short-term incentive targets that are more than the average company provides. So they have actually a, a, a money benefit of measuring relative to peers. Well, that, that's, that's actually quite interesting. I, I wonder how you can get companies to become aware of that. Do you, do you have to provide data over several years to say, listen, give us what your budget goals were you know, four years ago and, and um, you know, let's see how you, how well you did against those targets versus if you had a, a peer group. I mean, how, how can you get a management team to recognize what you're saying? Douglas, you have the solution. You should have told me 20 years ago. That's exactly <laughs> what we're doing. <laughs> That's exactly what we're doing. We are, um, uh, we are taking their historic payouts, their historic targets, and we compare them how aspirational these targets were and we can typically, in most cases, we can typically show them that they would have earned more if they measured themselves relative to peers, which always comes as a surprise because most managers think that their targets are low. Managers are overconfident. You know, it's natural. Otherwise, you don't become a manager. If you're not, <laughs> it's true. If you're not very optimistic about the future, you don't become a manager. So these are optimistic people, and the result is their targets are too high. And measuring relative to peers becomes actually a much fairer way to assess their performance. I think, uh, okay, that's really quite, quite um, revealing what, what, what you're saying here. I would say that in this, you know, the year 2020, clearly measuring performance relative to peers makes sense uh, because, <laughs> or in 2009, when, when you have such a massive external um, factors beyond your control, which, which have dramatically upturned what anybody expected for the year, you know, you, you can throw out whatever goals you set yourself. And, and then using a relative performance measurement tool under that context makes sense. Yeah. And, and also, I, I think from what I've understood, because you have access to all these databases, because you have standardized ways of, of mining this data, is it fair to, assume that the cost that somebody will incur trying to do this themselves and maintain it themselves would be higher than if they turned to you and had you generate this report for them? It depends, it depends how, you know, how broad, um, 
how broad you look at that. Uh, once you, you take several performance indicators, uh, especially also ESG, it becomes a lot more economical to work with us. Um, if it's only if you only look at one uh, number and if you only look at a couple of competitors, you may be able to do it yourself. But we recommend to uh, to look at at least twenty competitors so that you have to smooth out the outliers. You know, you have a more reliable um, set of data to benchmark against them. And when you look at twenty. 25 companies on a quarterly basis to always know where you are, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of specialized work too. Uh, and we, we do exclusively that. So we have economies of scale getting that data. Well, I, I think that makes sense. Maybe, maybe the other point that one could say is if, if you're in a board and you're having this work done, I think you want somebody who's effectively neutral, uh, somebody that, that isn't maybe trying to Manipulate the data one way or the other, uh, but but is doing it in a ideally in a neutral, established format. Um, I think that would you know because you are dealing with with a significant point uh, part of compensation has a significant impact on motivation, and and ultimately people want to f uh, they want uh, to to be assured that it's being done in a fair um, and accurate manner. Yeah, and especially because you know these. Uh, this data gathering is not free of judgments. You always have to apply judgments. You know, you have, when, you have, when there's an acquisition in a peer, you have to decide how much do you account for? Uh, do you eliminate that peer? Because uh, you cannot account for the acquisition. Uh, when there are currency uh, translations, you have to make uh, judgment calls about the mix of the business of, of, of these competitors. Uh, when there is a, a major event, uh, you know, uh, in that company, you know, if they have a fraud case or whatever, there's judgment involved. If you have a mix of your own business, we just had that this year, that is extremely unfavorable to you and is not reflected in the peer group, you have to make a judgment. So there are many, many judgments that you have to take. And if you're neutral, uh, it really is a big advantage. You can look at that and you can make a sensible application of, of judgment without having to fear, uh, you know, that people tell you you're biased. Well, that, that actually raises a point. So who is your customer? Is it is it the CEO or is it the board? Because if I'm your customer and I'm the CEO, you can be sure that if your judgment isn't aligned with mine, I, I may not want to work with you the following year. <laughs> well, the reality is our customer is the CEO. I mean, this is the reality. Sometimes there are provisions in the companies where the board really executes the request for data gathering. But at the end of the day, you're serving the company. I mean, this, this, is, just, this is just the case. But we have a reputation to lose. So it's a little bit give and take, like an audit company. I mean, the order comes from the company. The money comes from the company to pay for our services. But we have to make sure we can stand behind everything we recommend. Okay, that, that would make sense. Um, but there, so there is a dialogue then. And, and, it is and, a dialogue. And you know, audit companies are also under pressure. Uh, and we've seen cases. I don't know if we want to mention Enron, just to start with one. But, um, you know, where, where audit companies, you know, bend um, and, and uh, you know, so... Yeah. Enron is a really good case, Douglas. Remember, I mean, you were at that anniversary in 2005, where or six maybe it was 2006, where we had Eckhart Pfeiffer visiting in Obermott, the restaurant right. where we got yeah. founded. You were there as a guest because you were a client at that time, <laughs> and um, uh, they, and, and um, Eckhart Pfeiffer, the CEO, the former CEO of Compaq, which is also based in Texas, like Enron. Um, explained because he knew them, you know, very personally. Explained what happened at Enron, and it was really that culture of pushing people to the limit, you know, get, giving them higher and higher and higher targets, that made it ever more difficult to to perform. And because you know there was this culture of extreme outperformance, you had actually a situation where managers were pushed into. Uh, dealing from, uh, with uh, frontly, you know, I, I think our method is a much more balanced method where the target bonus is is safer to achieve. It's 
it's safe, it's safe to be in the middle of the market. It's a safe place. You still get more money if you outperform the middle. This is still something that rewards managers, but it doesn't push them to the borders, to the limit, so that they may actually start to cheat. That's a really good point. I mean, I, I, so how do you how do you make maybe a final question? You know, before we wrap up our talk for today, how do you how do you make companies aware of this? How, how do you because I mean there is validity in this. You're basically saying people are getting recognized for what they do. They're they're setting potentially more reasonable goals for themselves and for their teams, which ultimately will motivate them more because they will be rewarded for a success, which is potentially more readily achievable. How do you get, how do you make, how do you make people running companies aware of this? Well, uh, it's a tough process. It's a lot of work. It's company by company. Uh, we contact them directly. We send them, we, we do a lot of publishing. I've published maybe 50 articles on that topic. I'm giving interviews. I'm doing an hour interview. You know, we do an interview together, which we use to help people understand what we're doing. And we have to give, we have to, we have to give that across. We also have compensation consultancies that we work together. You know, consultancies specialized in executive compensation. They use us for the data mining. And that helps. We get a lot of recommendations, uh, recommendations from compensation consultancies. Uh, something that I started to do in um, uh, 2009, I did it again now in 2020, was to show how they would have done on our system. Because, you know, we, we calculate the performance on companies on an on a automated basis. It's on our website, actually. Every quoted company, more, company more than 12,000 worldwide, sees their performance on our website. And we have that information already. So what we can do is we can send them the information uh, with how well they did in the crisis year. And that helps them understand the advantages of measuring performance relative to peers. That makes sense, yeah. Well, I wish you much success for the next 20 years. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Next 20 years, that's probably the amount that I will, will spend at Overmart. <laughs> Hopefully after 10 years supported by the next generation. <laughs> well, there's always an opportunity here to improve things. And you did bring them ESG as a really, it sounds very exciting what can be done there because you, you're dealing with forward indicators. But Herman, thank you very much for, for taking time today to give me an update on what's happening with the company and, and wish you really great success going forward for, for your company, obviously, but also for all the companies that will benefit from what you have to share with them. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas. It was a really, really interesting question. It's critical, but I like that. I like the fact. <laughs> Thank you, Herman. Bye-bye.